Let's pray a little bit of an update, and then we'll get into our Bible study. Lord Jesus, again, as we open up your word, we ask you to open our hearts, our minds, so that we may rightly understand it, know what we're to believe, teach, confess, and do. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Now, where we left off last, we are, again, working our way through the book of First Samuel, and when we last left off, we talked about the story of how the Ark of God was captured, how Eli, Eli's, the, the high priest, how his son Hophni and Phinehas died in battle, and then we noted that God himself doesn't play kindly with other so-called deities. Uh, in particular, Dagon of the Philistines suffered great harm at the, uh, at the hands of Yahweh after they captured the Ark of the Covenant, and all of this is to, in order to kind of tell the bigger story, the bigger story be talking about what the kingdom of God is. And I, I keep, will keep coming back to remind us what, you know, what we're looking at here because you cannot understand the concept of the kingdom of God apart from, and I mean this, apart from looking at how Scripture discusses these things. And so we're going to be actually be in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8 today. I was you know, making sure that I got our wrap, our wrap up there. So this chapter now begins really kind of the real turn in the narrative regarding Israel as it relates to the kingdom of God and what it is. And we will note that Judges, the last sentence of the book of Judges, makes it clear that in this time there was no king in Israel, a physical king. God is technically king. Actually, not even technically, he really is. And the people of Israel are going to demand that they have a king just like all the other nations. And there's a theology involved in that that we will take a look at as we dive into 1 Samuel chapter 8 today. Here's what it says. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his first son was Joel. The name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. I don't know, you know, if you're looking for a biblical name for your kids, grandkids, Abijah, you know, it's like, it's a biblical name. <laughs> Just say it. Yeah. All right. His sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. And again, I'm going to highlight the fact that over and again, Scripture refers to those whose lives are conducted according to how God would have us act and do. It is described as walking. You know, so these guys didn't walk like their father, Samuel. They walked in a different way. Their life was conducted, well, by turning aside after shameful gain. So they took bribes and they perverted justice. So then all the elders of Israel gathered together, came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but... They have rejected me from being king over them. That's critical. They have rejected God as being their king. We don't want God to rule us. We want a king. So this isn't just a matter of them mimicking and having leadership that is similar to the leadership that other nations have. This is ultimately theological. God, we don't want you to be our king. We want to have our own king. A king who will do what we want him to do. So they can lord over the king. So they can, lord, they can be kind of lords of themselves, you would. And this is really the human, this is the human condition. And so God, you're going to notice, he acquiesces to their desires. It's kind of along the lines of be careful of what you ask for. Buyer beware. All right, you guys want a king? Fine, you can have a king. I'd be happy to let you have a king. And this doesn't work out well. Now, 
From there, you're going to note this. I'll kind of set it up this way. The first king of Israel is exactly what everybody would want from a king. And we're going to see this as the story progresses in just a little bit here. That the king that God chooses for them, he's tall, he's handsome, and his parents are loaded. He's, ri- he's rich. Let me ask you a question. Are not those who are tall, handsome, and rich today, do they not live like royalty? They don't have to be monarchs to live like royalty, do they? People Right. What do we do with people like that? We make them movie stars. We throw money at them. They don't have to work a single day in their lives. They're complete spoiled brats. What if you have two out of three of those attributes? <laughs> well, I'm not wealthy. I'm definitely not tall. <laughs> you must be handsome. <laughs> I've got a face and a body for radio. Um, (laughs) I've got nothing going for me. (laughs) So (laughs) I know you were referring to yourself, David. I yeah, and I know you. You yeah, I know. I get it. Yeah. So, so the first king that they're going to get is exactly what the world is looking for: somebody who's young, tall, rich, well-to-do. We idolize that person, and this is the king they're going to get. Be careful what you ask for, because it's not going to work out well. The second king they will get will be as a result of God rejecting the first king. And you'll see that. And the second king they get is going to be the pinnacle archetype of the Messiah in relation to his kingly aspects. And that's King David. And he's the high water mark, really, in the, monarchies, in the monarchy of Israel. And so from David until the time of the Babylonian exile you see this steady decline. And with the Babylonian exile, what also ends? The, king, the kingdom of Israel. The kingdom's gone. And so it disappears during the intertestamental period also as well. That's when the, uh, the Seleucids reigned in Israel after Alexander the Great. And the, you know, so you, you lose all that. When the scene opens... With the, with the Gospels, who's reigning over Israel? Rome is. Who is Rome's, um, uh, uh, basically, who's the guy put in charge of the region by Rome? Herod. And he's an Idumean. He's not, he's not Jewish. And he is not in the, in the line of David at all. But, you know, through his political machinations, he's the, quote, king of, of Israel, but after his death, none of his sons actually are given that same office. You have tetrarchs and things like that, but King Herod, as it was, doesn't exist. That was a blip on the map. So when we come into the New Testament, there is no king, there hasn't been a king, and the people living there are frustrated, they are oppressed, they are under Gentile pagan rule and authority. And so when Jesus begins his ministry, his first words are, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So kind of bookended then. Here you see Israel jumping the tracks. They reject God as king. They reject the kingdom of heaven as rule over them. And when Jesus shows up, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's literally announcing that God as king is at hand. That's the idea. You see it? So that's kind of vital part. So where the kingdom is is where God reigns. But it's not geographic today. So as we continue this thought, we'll continue to flesh it out. So God says, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me, serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So, 
Samuel told all the words of Yahweh to the people who were asking for a king from him. And he said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants, and he will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but Yahweh will not answer you in that day. Now note, this is designed to make them see just how wicked their request for a king is and what's going to be the result of them having a king. They'll be slaves to that king. That's how monarchs rule, right? And so you'd think that the people sit there and go, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, we didn't know that we were bargaining for that. But watch what their people say. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, there shall be a king over us. Well, that's great. So you note their wickedness. Now, let me... I've got to find a passage in the New Testament here. Uh, Here it is. It is Matthew 17. I want you to compare this to what we just read. So you note that the uh, kingdoms of humanity... Um, have a tendency to enslave the, uh, their subjects. And I want you to consider this by way of contrast. Here's what it says, Matthew 17, 24. Uh, when they, that's Jesus and his disciples, came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay tax? Does Jesus pay his taxes? Uh-huh. He does, but watch the theology on this. So Peter said, yes. (laughs) And then he came into the house and Jesus spoke to him first. So Jesus knew what was going on outside. So you see Peter coming in going, I gotta find Jesus. And no sooner does he find Jesus, Jesus begins talking to him. And so he asks Peter a question. So what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons? or from others? It's from the others. So back in the day, the king's sons, did they pay their taxes? They didn't have an IRS form to fill out, did they? They were exempt because they were sons. So he said, well, from others. Jesus said to him, so then the sons are free. I mean, yeah, right? However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea, cast a hook, Take the first fish that comes up, and when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Jesus pays his taxes and Peter's taxes. Notice that. And you'll see a little bit of an idea then about the kingdom of God. Are we citizens of the kingdom of God? Yes. What's our status as citizens in the kingdom of God? Are we sons and daughters, or are we other? We're sons and daughters. Now, understand this then. Who is king of kings and lord of lords? Jesus. Is there any human government on this planet that is not established by Christ? Nope. Either for good or for judgment of the people underneath him, right? That being the case, note the theology here. We are exempt from paying taxes because we're sons. However, we must pay our taxes for whose sake? According to this text. Read the text. It tells you. Whose conscience do we have to be concerned about when it comes to paying our taxes? Okay. 
Okay. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook. So here's the reason why we pay our taxes. Are you ready? Because it would be scandalous to our neighbors if we didn't. So for their sake, we pay our taxes. Uh huh. Isn't that interesting? I know who the them was referring to. Yeah, the them is them. It's an us them thing, right? We, citizens of the kingdom of God, who are adopted sons and daughters of God, we are exempt from taxes in God's kingdom. That being the case, we are not exempt. We must pay our taxes because of other people's consciences. Although, if we decided we just weren't going to pay our taxes, just going to stop altogether, send a letter to the IRS and Uncle Sam saying, just read that I'm a son of the kingdom. Jesus says, I'm exempt from paying taxes, so I've decided this year I'm not going to do that. I'm pretty sure the IRS might send somebody to your home, (laughs) or they just might find a way to siphon the money off of your bank account directly, or whatever. They have these ways of doing things, right? But they would be offended. So there's that atheist guy at the IRS, because everybody knows nobody can be a Christian work for the IRS. (laughs) (laughs) Tongue-in-cheek. Yeah. So there's that atheist at the IRS going, this is horrible. I can't believe that this person claiming to be a Christian is not going to pay their taxes, right? They would be offended. Is that an interesting theology? Have you ever thought of it that way? What about the IRS? They have a form for that. <laughs> Make sure you fill it out in triplicate. <laughs> right? Yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and then after you've sent that thing in 10 times, you might get a response, but that's a different story altogether. So we as Christians, we are exempt from taxes and we're not exempt. We're exempt in the truest sense and the only reason why we pay our taxes is for the sake of our neighbor's conscience. Isn't that interesting? So even paying your taxes is a good work for the sake of your neighbor. Have you ever considered that on April 15th? I will know. Uh-huh. Now that's the best part about it. So here, here's the fun part. So the day of judgment arrives. There you are standing before Jesus and the books are opened. And Jesus is looking through the books, right? And since all of our sins are atoned for, not, there's nothing there to accuse us. All that's left are our good works. And literally Jesus says to you, David Fagelin, oh, whoa, check, you paid your taxes. And you, and you say, oh, yeah, of course, I had to. And he says, good work, I'm going to reward that. And you go, really? R- really? Yeah. No, for real. No, this, these are good works. So, th- so knowing that then, think about this. Knowing that, you now have the freedom that come April 15th, when you write that check to the government, or you know, you know that you've got you owe and you have to send in money and stuff like that, that you can sit there and go, This is to the glory of God. This is a good work for the sake of my neighbor and his conscience. And God sees it as that. And the good news also, when Jesus returns in glory to judge the living and the dead, he makes all things new and we can, we're in his visible kingdom. Will you pay taxes from that point forward? Never again. Never again. You are exempt. So this idea that in this world there is only two things that are for sure, death and taxes, I mean, that's really true. I mean, yeah. I don't know how to avoid either. (laughs) So in in the kingdom that it will be revealed, there will be no death and no taxes. It'll be life tax free. That's right. Can't wait. So let's go back here. So here, Samuel, he warns them about how their king is going to enslave them. That's how the kings, kings of the earth operate. They say, no, there shall be a king over us so that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, 
He repeated them in the ears of the Lord in Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Samuel, Obey their voice. Make them a king. Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go, every man to his city. And so what happens next is kind of a fascinating story. Kind of everyone goes back to the city. God's going to choose somebody. So I think this is like yeah, America's got talent. This is Israel's next monarch, you know, real life television show coming up. That's kind of the idea here is that everyone heads back and there's this expectation that God's going to do something and give them the king that they want. So the narrative steers then in this way. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. He had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So he's wealthy. He has a six-pack. He's got Fabio hair. And the, every time he walks into a room, the women go, <laughs> this, this is the fellow we're talking about, a prince on earth all according to the world's standards, not God's. Notice that men judge on appearances. God judges the heart. So by all the appearances, this guy has everything going for him. But appearances can be quite deceiving, can they not? Now the donkeys of Kish... You kind of have to think of it this way. Donkeys are quite expensive in the ancient world. And if your family owns one of them, you're doing pretty good. They have several donkeys go missing, which is kind of like the ancient world's version of a Ferrari. Right? I know it doesn't seem like that way because you have to clean up after them, but there's donkeys, plural. So he, this guy's very wealthy. When they came to the... Okay, so the, the donkeys of... All right, wait, wait. Okay, now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, they were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son. By the way, fascinating, the, the Hebrew pronunciation for Saul is Shaul. Uh, it's fascinating that it doesn't actually come across. We just it, transliterated it Saul. Technically, his name is Shaul. So Kish said to Shaul, his son, take one of the young men with you. Arise, go, and look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim, passed through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. They passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. So they're on a wild donkey chase, pun intended. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servants who, who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. And we're going to note here, this whole donkey chase was orchestrated by God. God organized this in order to get Saul to a particular place. So he said to them, behold, there's a man of God in this city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. That's kind of an important note right there, because Samuel is the first of the prophets from this era. All that he says comes true. True prophets always prophesy and what they say comes about. You're going to see what a true prophet sounds like and the type of specific details that a true prophet gives as opposed to the f- people running around the landscape today claiming to be prophets. But you'll know, all that he says comes true. It says of Samuel, not one of his words that the Lord gave him ever fell to the ground. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. So then Saul said to his servants, but if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone. There's no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Shaul again. Here I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I'll give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly, in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, come, let us go see the ra'ah. The seer, for today's prophet, Hebrew word is navi, was formerly called a seer. Now, this little aside here in the text may seem 
a little odd and somewhat out of place. What does this tell you about when this account was written down? Was it at the same time that the events took place, or was it later? A little later. And the reason why is because the language had changed a little bit. Formerly, they were called seers, ra'ah, the ra'aim. Now they are called the nabaim, the prophets. And so, whenever this was recorded, it was recorded after the fact, and after enough time had passed in Israel's history, that the language had modified just a little bit. All right? that, this kind of information is actually very helpful in helping us kind of pinpoint when it was written, who was writing it, and things like that. And we know from other internal data that the, these books were compiled by the prophets themselves. And so this little aside gives us interesting historical uh, insight. So Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us... Go, so they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up to the hill, uh, up the hill to the city, they met, uh, met young women coming to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered, He is. Behold, he's just ahead of you. Hurry. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today on the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat, for the people will not eat until he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, those who are invited will eat. Notice, kind of like a precursor to table blessings. It's right there in Scripture. So now go up, for you will meet him immediately. So they went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now, the day before Shaul came, Yahweh had revealed to Samuel, tomorrow about this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. I Consider the implications of this for a second. From Saul's point of view and his servant, donkeys went missing, they went to find them, they couldn't find them, they're now seeking the aid of the prophet. From their point of view, everything they're doing, they decided upon doing. But the whole time, who was ordering their steps? God. This tells you a little bit about how our lives operate. Consider the implications. Well, the bondage of the will is is actually dealing with the doctrine of original sin. This has to do with God's providence. And in Scripture, it talks about the one who loves the Lord, who meditates on His Word, walks in His ways. That person, God will make His paths straight, Scripture says. Proverbs explicitly talks in in these terms. Have you considered these things? So as we walk in our lives, we are hit by a series of different circumstances. Some good, We always love those. And some just God-awful pull you through the ringer. Your life is in turmoil. Your family is upside down. It's just awful. None of these things happen outside of the will of God. And God in His providence and His sovereignty is actually working all of this out. And oftentimes the suffering and the difficulties that we go through, God brings them into our lives in order to humble us, in order to help continue the work of sanctifying us, to lead us to repentance and other things. So we can see here that God's hand is upon all of these events, and through these events, he's he's exactly what he wants to have done is happening. There's just no way around it. So I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. Now, don't think for a second that, that because it says prince in the ESV that somehow that doesn't mean that Saul's going to be king. The uh, Hebrew word here, nagid, um, it could be, it's like a, it can mean prince, it can, be, it can mean leader, uh, you know, the head honcho, chief of state, kind of, that's kind of the idea. And so it's a synonym to king, but it, it, that's really what it is. You shall anoint him to be prince, and anoint is the Hebrew, here, uh, Hebrew word mashach, 
which should sound a lot like the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. So you note that kings are anointed. He will be anointed prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines. So there's a salvation motif in here. For I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. And when Samuel saw Shaul, the Lord said to him, Here's the man of whom I spoke. He it is who shall restrain my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered Saul, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and, I, and tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for your father's house? Now before we see Saul's answer, note here, this prophet of God knew exactly why Saul was there without Saul having to tell him, because it was told to him by God. It shows you the quality of God's revelations. When God gives, gives prophecy, he gives specific details. So Saul answered, Samuel says, Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? Samuel took Saul and his young man, brought them into the hall, gave them a place at the head of those who had been invited, who were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion I gave you, of which I said to you, put it aside. So cook, the cook took up the leg that was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, see, what was kept is set aside before you. Eat because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. And at the daybreak of dawn, Samuel called to Saul on the rooftop, Up, that I may send you on your way. So Saul rose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. And as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, Has not Yahweh anointed you to be prince, Nagid, ruler, over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of Yahweh, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be the prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys that, that you went to seek are found, and now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go on from there farther and come to the oak of Tabor, Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. Boy, is that typo typological. A sacrifice and bread and wine. Always pay attention to those things in the Old Testament. They will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. After that, you shall come to Gibeah Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, lyre before them prophesying. Then the Spirit of Yahweh will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Notice the minutia of these signs. You're going to be at this place. You're going to see three guys. One's carrying goat, bread, wine. He's going to say this, this, that, and this. Notice the specificity. There isn't a single person in the charismatic movement claiming to be a prophet who can give this this, who gives these types of prophecies? 
the, the stuff they, they talk about is nonsense. They'll say things like, the Lord is telling me that in this season, He's going to be giving you a breakthrough anointing so that your suddenly will happen. You know, this is how they talk. You say, what does any of that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just nonsensical words. It's, compare their prophecies to a prophecy like this, and you can see, wow. And the text basically goes on to say that those signs all came to pass that exact same day, exactly how Samuel said they would, because Samuel's a true prophet. Kind of get the idea. Now, we'll pause here today, and we'll pick up then with um, where it goes. So Saul is now anointed as king, but he's not reigning yet. There's more of a process that he has to go through, and we'll pick up that process next week.